You know the drill, all hands on deck for the top 5 sci-fi military commanders. If you like this vid, be sure to check out its brother video- <laughs> Who am I kidding? If you're here, it's because you came from the Thrones vid. Same rules as its brother video, we're defining a military commander as anything from the leader of a single army all the way up to a faction leader who coordinates full-scale war, and they're judged on how good they are at that job. Because let's be honest, these lists are basically nothing more than a way for us to have fun talking about our favourite fictional characters who have military roles. We do, however, have one rule difference from the Thrones vid, and that is only one commander from each franchise. Until we break that rule and do two for Star Wars, but we are sticking to one per era, so not favoritizing the oldest child too much on that one. Love you, Star Wars, he's a good boy. Jumping straight in at number five, we have the Emperor of Mankind from Warhammer 40,000. 40k fans will sulk like babies at Emp's being placed at the bottom, and I can't wait for those comments, but in all honesty, it's where he belongs. He deserves a spot on this list because, let's face it, no one from his universe, and that's a universe filled with godlike beings, could have achieved what he achieved on the military front. He took humanity when they were at their lowest possible point, at least up until a certain heresy some might argue he helped cause, and rallied them into one of the greatest military powers in the galaxy. The Imperium was adaptable and could overwhelm just about any foe in its way, and again we're talking about some extremely heavy hitters. And all this power can be credited directly back to Emps and his patience, strategy, and sheer force of will. His literal godlike powers may also have played a part, but we can't say for certain. And what was the Emperor's greatest strength? Big shoulders. The Emperor of Mankind has some big shoulders, and not just in the literal sense. The only reason the Imperium can maintain anything resembling a foothold and keep kicking is because of his innovations like the Adeptus Astartes and his powering of the Astronomicon. He single-handedly holds the Imperium together, even as a suffering corpse on the Golden Throne. Say what you want about the Emperor, but you can't say he doesn't care about humanity and is willing to suffer immensely to hold his forces together. And the Emperor's greatest weakness? keeps his cards too close to his chest. While the Emperor was a secularist and believed there were no gods, he himself had a bit of a god complex and thinking he knew best. I guess unbelievable amounts of psychic power, enough that making a planet full of super soldiers forcibly kneel before you is barely an effort, might do that to you. While it's important for a commander to know when to keep information hush, it's also very important to know when to share it with your allies, if only to reassure and maintain their faith in your ability to lead. Because as a certain pink-haired gender studies general also learned, being tight-lipped can inspire mutiny. The Emperor had a hard time trusting anyone with his big picture, with his close friend Malkador the Sigilite being a rare exception. You all know where I'm going with this. Primarchs! These fucking guys! Half of whom tore the Imperium a new asshole. When it came to the ones who fell to chaos, you can, from a certain point of view, blame each one's fall, with the exception of maybe Lorgar on the Emperor's lack of trust in them. These are not itty bitty children who can't grasp lofty concepts. They are 20 foot tall demigods who can do just about anything they set their mind to, have the intelligence of a goddamn supercomputer, and embody both the best and worst traits of the human condition. Any good commander would understand that these fuckers needed to be clued in. So, why the bottom of the list? Well, besides the fact the Emperor's main strategy, let's be honest, seemed to be let's just kick the front door down with overwhelming force in 99% of battles, Emps kind of fucked up. Like, big time fucked up more so than anyone else on this list, and due to his actions left a once glistening beacon of hope in a grim dark galaxy as a wretched, bloated, bureaucratic mess that is slowly suffocating under its own weight and bringing mass misery to the people it claims to safeguard. Now, it could have been a worthy sacrifice had the Emperor succeeded in destroying Chaos, the greatest, most insidious threat to humanity. But did he accomplish this? Did. He. Fuck. Sorry 40k fans, but this is one list where you're not getting that top spot. Who are these big golden people pointing at me with their spear guns, Tom? It's another one of your practical jokes. Oh shit. On to our number four pick, and we have the Star Wars prequel era, and our choice for best commander is General Anakin Skywalker. This is the Clone Wars! Yeah, no kidding! And also Vader during the reign of the Empire because it's our list, get off my back! But Emps pwns Annie, I hear you typing into the comments. But this is not a dick measuring contest of their personal power. We're judging them as military commanders and scaling them to their respective universe. And in that regard, we think Annie edges Emps out ever so slightly. Anakin kicked ass all the way across the galaxy during the Clone Wars, and didn't need Primarchs and God levels of power to help him do it. And while he was also fond of the let's kick the front door down approach, you're overdoing it. 
again. Master, I mean no disrespect. If you want, I can hide here with you and we can let the people in the city suffer longer. He was also pretty creative when it came to tactics and strategy, which we think gives him the slightest edge on the Emperor. Basically, the higher-ups would tell him what needed doing and step back while he accomplished his objective in whatever unconventional yet highly effective way he saw fit. As Vader, he became the Emperor's personal messenger to the Empire's enemies and the message would always be, You done fucked up, boy. Needless to say, these individuals wouldn't be fucking up again. Now, obviously, we would be remiss if we didn't mention that Anakin, much like Ems, made some shitty choices as a military commander that led to a certain despot claiming power and ruling the galaxy with an iron fist for 20 years. But in fairness, he demonstrated who was the boss tactician against those younglings, so can we really hold it against him? Ooh, we might have got a bit too dark there, Tom. What was the Chosen One's greatest strength? Simple respect. Unlike his fellow Jedi generals, Anakin, largely thanks to his upbringing as a slave, understood how unfair the universe was and what it was like to be at the bottom of the pile, gifting him a good grasp on the idea of the push and pull mentality necessary for a good commander and the necessary sacrifices that cannot be avoided in war, while still maintaining compassion and respect for the clones who were fighting alongside him, seeing them as individual people rather than disposable bodies. As Vader, this carried through. Vader's hatred of incompetent officers who had risen through the ranks through Nepal is well known. But when it came to the guys in the mud, Vader held a great deal of respect for the lowly stormtrooper and grunts, admiring their courage and devotion to duty. This respect was very often reciprocated by the soldiers serving under Vader, who admired Vader's willingness to get stuck in and get his hands dirty alongside them. This led to the stormtroopers serving in the 501st, holding loyalty to Vader first and the Empire second. And the Chosen One's greatest weakness was brashness. You underestimate my power. Anakin was always a little too keen to get stuck in, and while he mellowed out and learned the value of patience as Vader, he could still often overreach when he thought victory was close at hand, squeezing a bit too hard and allowing his adversary to slip through his fingers. While seizing the initiative is important in a good military commander, the importance of a light touch and measured approach can also not be undervalued. While he wasn't easy to provoke, if you did provoke him, Anakin and to some extent Vader often ended up exposing himself and his forces. Still, if you've got some filthy rebel scum to hunt down or some clankers to blow up, you could definitely trust Anakin slash Vader to get the job done. All too easy. At number three, we have Ender Wiggin. Because no list about military commanders is complete without at least one child who shouldn't have to bear the responsibilities of leadership. For the Thrones list, this was Rob, and for our sci-fi one, it's Ender Wiggin. There isn't really much I can add to his story that fans of the book slash film don't already know, because Ender being an absolute boss at tactics and strategy, even as a young lad, is kind of one of the big plot points of the story. Strategic genius doesn't quite cut it when it comes to describing this boy's skills. Knocking him down was the first fight. I wanted to win all the next ones too. So they'd leave me alone. Enough so that I think he could genuinely give some of the best sci-fi tacticians in fiction like Thrawn, Sisko, and Admiral Hackett a run for their money when he was only a child. Ender's greatest strength? Empathy. Sure, he's got supreme intellect, a strong will, and is just all around strategically brilliant, but Ender's greatest asset is his empathy. He can think like his enemy, and this is a demonstrably powerful asset in war, especially in the territory of sci-fi, where opponents can quite literally be as alien as they come when it comes to technology, doctrine, and culture. Being able to think like your enemy also allows you to outmaneuver them and do what they least expect, something the previous two commanders quite often struggled with, both of whom preferred straight-up overwhelming forces in their tactics. Ender's greatest weakness? Um, empathy. We won! That's all that matters. No. The way we win matters. Now, let's be fair to Ender, he's a goddamn kid. This is to be expected and shouldn't be held against the guy. But it's a very, very, very big flaw in a military leader. Ender doesn't quite have the stomach to have people die under his command or to order the death of his enemies. And because of this, he hesitates with the very real sacrifices you just can't avoid in war, no matter how good of a strategist or tactician you are. I mean, they had to convince this kid he was playing a fancy video game in order to get him to make the tough decisions that would allow mankind to 
to win. What good has it been able to outmaneuver your foes if you can't bring yourself to give the order? Regardless of this, however, Ender's got the skills, and that warrants him a spot on this list. I will bear the shame of this genocide forever. Moving on to number two, and it's the Star Wars original trilogy era. And can it really be anyone else other than everyone's favorite Grand Admiral? Like, seriously, come on, guys. What was first just a dream has become a frightening reality for those who may oppose us. I do, however, want to give a quick shout out slash honorable mention to Admiral Akbar. The attack on the first Death Star was kind of a last minute scramble as the rebellion desperately fought for its survival after being tracked by the Empire. But when it came to the most crucial and decisive attack of the entire rebellion's history, that being the assault on the second Death Star, Old Fishface was the guy they trusted to lead it. And even when it became clear rebel intelligence had fucked up, like, Big time that thing's fully operational, fucked up. He still rallied his fleet and held the line long enough for Han to get the shield down and Lando and Wedge to blow shit up. Just saying, don't discount mister, it's a trap and give him his due. However, when it comes to the OT and beyond era, it's got to be Thrawn. The Chiss is a force of nature when put into a command position. Now, of course he was handed his butt quite a few times during the Rebels TV series, but one must remember that as much as you could watch it as an adult and not feel too ashamed ashamed of yourself. It was a show aimed at children, and in these sorts of shows, it's important the goodies win and the baddies lose. Follow Thrawn in any other media, however, like the comics, books, and Ahsoka series, and what you find is someone who can outplay the very best to such a degree that it makes their efforts appear futile from the off. Even the Force cannot save you against the Grand Admiral. Thrawn's greatest strength? He's always 50 moves ahead. Thrawn has a unique, non-linear way of thinking, and to say his tactics come with a level of complexity to them is kind of like comparing high-level brain surgery to placing a band-aid on a cut. Even Thrawn's defeats are often part of the big picture, leaving his adversaries in a constant state of unease and unknowing whether their victory was true or just all part of the plan and the bigger trap the Chiss is laying. His study of his enemy's culture, particularly their art, gifts him with insight and often has him knowing his enemies better than they know themselves. Themselves. How did you know? Because rebels have friends always rushing to the rescue. Even a restricted force doesn't seem to be a problem, as Thrawn often finds himself in the underdog spot, having to work with less than most. And yet he still finds a way to get the most out of his limited resources and strike fear into the heart of his foes. Thrawn's greatest weakness? He's always 50 moves ahead. Yes, you heard that right, like Ender, his biggest strength is also his greatest weakness. Thrawn often sets the dominoes up to fall in a very specific way. And while he can adapt his plans on the fly and salvage victory from the clutches of a monumental fuck-up, Thrawn is often just too smart for his own good. This doesn't really factor into his actions, but the actions of those below him and under his command. His underlings sometimes can't see the sense in his plans, and so when they are presented with an opportunity they think will gain them glory and victory, they will usually jump on it without considering if it will compromise Thrawn's big picture. Spoiler alert, it often does. Constantine, return to your assigned coordinates immediately. I've had enough of your games, Grand Admiral. This leaves Thrawn not only having to accommodate his enemies' unexpected actions and moments of brilliance, but also having to be on the lookout for overly ambitious idiots screwing with his machinations from within his own ranks. And unlike the Emperor of Mankind, where a bit of trust in subordinates could have gone a long way, Thrawn's idea are generally so complex and non-linear that his underlings likely wouldn't understand them anyway and interpret them as the ravings of a madman, making the sharing of such tactics a wasted effort and we all know how Thrawn feels about wasting effort. What good is it being a tactical savant if the people entrusted to carry out your vision don't even understand it? Still, Thrawn deserves the number two spot and if it wasn't for the fact that our number one pick has the distinction of non-failure in their objectives as a commander, then I would have happily put Thrawn at number one. We'll never surrender to you, Thrawn. You misunderstand, Captain. I'm not accepting surrenders at this time. I want you to know failure, utter defeat, and that it is I who delivers it crashing down upon you. Before we get to that top spot, we have one honorable mention suggested by one of our longtime viewers, Lox. Now, it's been too long since I watched Battlestar, so I'll have to take their word for it. So say we all! So say we all! 
Adama. But their suggestion for a great sci-fi military commander was William Adama. His greatest strength, singularity of purpose combined with pure grit. His greatest weakness, adherence to the old world power structures and the rules of engagement. And how did Lox make this suggestion to us? Now, Tom, fire the sneak attack Discord plug. So if you, like our awesome pal Lox, would like to contribute to our video ideas or just talk about your favorite franchises, check out our Discord server linked in the description. So who made our number one pick? It's not some scary blue alien, magic space wizard, child prodigy, or literal god in human form. No, it's... I think I'll be going. No, you absolutely shouldn't, good sir or possibly madam. You're getting the number one spot, and with good reason. Shepard may not be immensely powerful. In fact, they're basically just a man or woman with a few cybernetics. But when you place them within the scale of their own universe and the threat they faced, which was a galaxy-ending threat, by the way, Shepard did the impossible as a military leader. Ender rallied his forces, the Emperor rallied mankind, Skywalker rallied the Republic, and Thrawn rallied the Remnant. But Shepard rallied the entire galaxy behind him to face his universe's equivalent of a Lovecraftian super threat. And the most important part, Shepard won against impossible odds. The other commanders on this list ultimately failed their objectives to some degree in the long run. Even Ender kind of cracked when he found out what he'd actually done. But thanks to the Mass Effect 4 trailer and seeing Liara, we may not know which choice Shepard made regarding Synthesis, Control, or Destroy, and whether or not they were a badass renegade or a noble paragon. But we know thanks to Liara being alive that one of the highest military strength endings is the canon one, and that Shepard succeeded in defeating the Reapers. It cost them everything they had, including their life if Control or Synthesis is the canon Ending, but through their leadership, they ended a galaxy-wide threat. And sure, the Reapers aren't the biggest bad in the pot on the tech front when you scale them to other universes, but when you consider just how overpowered they are when they're scaled to the Mass Effect universe, I wouldn't be surprised if Shepard is remembered as some sort of Jesus-like deity for defeating them. Shep's greatest strength? Why, their dancing ability, of course! I'm gonna tear up the fucking dance floor, dude. Check it out. But in seriousness, it all comes down to their decision-making ability. Ask most fans what Shepard's greatest strength is, and they'll often tell you, not without good reason, that it's their ability to inspire loyalty in the right people. Shepard isn't the greatest soldier. I think you can hand that honor comfortably to Garrus or Rex. They're not a godlike biotic. Jack's got that shit covered all day. They're not the greatest intelligence officer. Miranda, and then eventually Liara, claims that crown. And they never would have gotten past the Collector's Stinger Drones were it not for Morden and his mad scientist brain. Hell, he would have never gotten off the ground in the first place without good old Joker in his corner. Point I'm making is Shepard, while a highly competent person, isn't the greatest at anything but they surround themselves with those who are. But ever wondered why these exceptional individuals and the rest of the galaxy are willing to follow them to death and beyond? It comes down to Shep's willingness to make bold and difficult decisions, face the consequences of them, both good and bad, and then press on. With a paragon or renegade, Shepard doesn't let their choices get in the way of their ultimate goal of stopping the Reapers. When mistakes are made, Shepard is already looking for the next move to put them back on track. We should also mention their colossal balls, even for Fem Shep. To stir down the Reapers with nothing but a pea shooter in hope, alongside kicking the ass of every single asshole who gets in your way without ever breaking step, takes planet-sized balls. It's not hard to follow a leader like that. And Shepard's greatest weakness as a leader? I mean, Paragon Shepard can sometimes sound like a bit of a whiny bitch here and there, but it's so few and far between, it's really hard to count it, especially after meeting Ryder in Mass Effect Andromeda. Jeez, next to that pansy, Shepard their most bitchy looks like Marlon Brando at peak badass by comparison. So yes, keep your gods, keep your Jedis and your child prodigies and your blue-skinned red-eyed art critics. Here at the Fandome, we're sticking with the balls of steel and no-nonsense approach of everyone's favorite N7 Spectre. And that's our list. These were just our personal favorites from our favorite works. The conversation doesn't end here, it only begins. Who do you guys think rank among these commanders? Perhaps some Star Trek or Halo to throw into the mix? Let us know down below. We honestly want to hear your suggestions and why. 